My next guest is the Chief Executive of the British Horse Racing Authority. She has been in situ since Nick Rust's departure in January of this year, prior to which she had held a board position on the BHA board, had also worked for what was then uh, Northern Racing, now part of the Arena Racing Company, and before that held senior positions in the brewing industry. Subsequent to leaving racing before her return to the sport, she held senior positions at the uh, Football Association before becoming head of British Cycling, quite a post to relinquish to come to run a sport as unwieldy, as complicated as difficult and with so many conflicting opinions as horse racing. Uh, Julie Harrington, welcome to the show. Welcome, well, welcome. <laughs> Thanks for having me. <laughs> not, not, not at all. And I suppose the obvious question is, having held fantastic positions in other sports, high profile sports like football and, and cycling, British cycling as well, why did you want to come back to racing? Perhaps I should have spoken to you before I took the job, <laughs> Nick. The, uh, I mean, it's really, it, the answer's really simple for me, is that uh, racing had my heart, that um, all the time I was away from racing and working in, in football and cycling, I was still a fan, mm. um, still going racing. Uh, you know, I love the, the variety that British racing has, whether it's, you know, stood on, a, on the hill, watching them running toward you at Bangor or having a, a fantastic day out dressed up at York. Um, and I was doing all that while I was working in football and cycling. So when the when the phone rang, um, obviously my first my, my first reaction was not a chance. Um, but then I, I I was thinking it through. I was still a fan. I was still watching racing on a Saturday with a laptop on my lap, um, and thinking, do you know what? I, I could I could stay on the outside criticising, or I could roll my sleeves up uh, and give it a go and 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 get involved. When you were on the outside then, what were you criticising? Um, probably um, racing's fantastic ability to beat itself up. The, it is a wonder sometimes that how, how do we get, you know, 1400 fixtures on a year. Um, and watching from the outside, slightly removed outside the racing bubble, um, we do an amazing job. You know, and I was watching from a, a distance when COVID hit, when I was running another sport, and I was watching enviously, just seeing racing pull together to every day keep the show on the road. I mean, it is a massive operation. No other sport in this country has so much sport. And, and we should be proud of that. And so much variety, so much heritage. And we, we're incredibly self-critical. Does it have too much sport? That it's a question that is asked so often and uh, for me it's a question of balance that um, we have, uh, we, you know, primarily we are a sport and so making sure that we have the ability for the most talented horses to make their way through um, has got to be paramount. But we're also an industry and we're an industry whose revenues are driven um, through media rights and through betting revenue. And so it is never as simple as just saying, let's reduce the, the, the number of times we race because it's a really complex ecosystem and, and it's, it's got to be balanced where we're balancing the needs. And, and for me, if we keep the North Star as the customer and, and what is it that the customer wants to see, whether that's the race goer or the punter um, and our biggest investor group, the owners, um, and just making sure that we are constantly delivering what they want. Uh, occasionally, I think we, we get that balance slightly wrong, um, but it is about balancing our ability to generate revenues for the sport um, and our ability to showcase the very best horses um, at the top of their game. How are you getting that balance wrong? Are you saying you're getting that balance wrong too much in favour of the owners or the horsemen or too little? in their favour? Where, where, where's the imbalance for you? I would say as a, as a customer, when I've been watching from the outside um, and speaking to you know, my friends and family that um, obviously we live this sport day in, day out. But for lots of people, they dip in and dip out. They're sports fans. Uh, and the thing that attracts them, the shop window, is obviously the, the quality end. It's the big racing festivals. Um, they're sports fans. So, you know, what comes on your radar in those those you know weekends like this weekend for ex for example um, and sometimes um, 
we, we need to make sure that that quality can shine through the volume. But in, but in terms of when, when you say the balance, you, you said, I sometimes think we get the balance wrong when it comes to particularly the owners, you said. Is that, did you feel owners just aren't getting a fair return? Is that what you're saying? So uh, I said that it's a question of balance yeah. and it is a complex um, every year to try and get that balance right. And when there is criticism, it's because people believe that the balance has slipped mm -hmm. slightly out of place. And depending on the audience, they, you know, uh, there was a really good series in the Racing Post recently, which, which showcased the sheer difference in views um, and trying to balance all those views because whether you're a bookmaker, whether you're a media, media company, whether you're an owner, uh, and you know, lots of the yard visits I've done since I've been in post, um, the response is different depending on the horses that people have got in their boxes. So if you've got a load of 0 to 70 rated horses, you want more racing at that end. If you're, you've got a, a load of, of group and pattern horses, you want more top end racing. So it, it's, it's constantly trying to keep that balance. And, and what I'm saying is if we can keep the interests of the customer at heart, mm. then hopefully that we will get that balance right. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about, about funding in a minute, but just on the on the fixtures, the fixture list will be released next week, is that next right? Next week, that's right, Nick, yeah. And so this year, 2021, 1,366 fixtures. 2020, there were 1,491. Can we expect more fixtures or fewer fixtures in 2022? I think you're going to see around the same. Okay. Um, and so it, it's re fixtures, of course, are only half the story. Um, the next challenge is to work with um, our constituency with the race courses with the the horsemen in terms of the race program that sits within those fixtures but in terms of 2022 um, obviously um, still in recovery mode for the sport and I think we shouldn't forget that and um, we're recovering from a pandemic and so we we will be putting on a fixture list that in terms of numbers is is um, much as we are this year. When you look at how small some of the fields have been through the last six weeks and you've seen three, four, five runner races on a fairly regular basis and right from the top all the way down to the bottom, because you'd expect smallish fields at the very top, pyramid of horses, abilities like yeah. that. How anxious does that make you feel about having a similar size fixture list for next year? So the team at the BHA are, are constantly um, looking at, at field sizes, as you can imagine, and trying to understand the story behind the numbers. Um, because you, you know it's like the med median and mode averages that you, you look at it across the year and, and would say there actually hasn't been that much of a shift since say 2016 but we're seeing underperforming races and really understanding why that is and and it's not all year it's at certain times of year there's been some innovations this year obviously there's been investment in the racing league we've had some investment in some big sunday races and and inevitably that's um, taking up some of the, the horse population and available runners and we might be seeing yeah. underperformance in the week that follows. Now, now you were not in charge of the BHA when the Racing League was granted its additional fixtures and the Sunday series fixtures are modified fixtures I suppose but isn't it Julie all displacement? It's extremely well intended displacement but all you're doing is taking the water out of one glass and pouring it into another. It's not, it's not solution to providing for a, a broad base of, 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 of racehorses and racehorse owners, is it? I don't think there, there is one magic one solution, Nick, and I, and I think a uh, huge plaudits to the people who are, who are innovating because we will learn through that innovation. Mm. Um, and that, you know, in, in every sport, as in life, as in other industries, we learn through trying things. And I, and I think we need to be brave enough to try things and, and it goes back to my original point about we are quite self-critical and I think we need to try, learn, iterate um, and and in terms of the, the entire shape of, of the fixture list and the race programme in future um, for 2023 and beyond, the BHA and the race courses and the horsemen working together to, to look at mm. what is working what can we change? Sure. So, so I, I don't want to go down a racing league rabbit hole <laughs> again, particularly. But on the basis, if they are granted their fixtures again in 2022, which I'm guessing they will be. Still, still, as I said, the, the fixture dates are going to be published next week. 
but there are still some sort of details around what's going to be happening. So we're not sure days. whether the racing league's returning in 2020. Still having conversations. Okay, still having conversations. But if that does come back, will you then compensate by moving other races around so you don't get that short field problem? Absolutely. I mean, that's the whole point of analysing what's happened this year. So um, through the next few months, while we're working on the race program that sits within the mm. fixtures, that's exactly the sort of work that will be going on. I mean, you'll be quite familiar with the keep owners in racing pressure group. Yes. Um, they've been very vocal on social media and elsewhere and have produced a blueprint for the future of racing. Uh, been very vocal over the last 24 hours. They've said there's a profound sense that owners are badly let down by current leadership, governance structures and woefully inadequate decision making arrangements. Is that a sentence that you can identify with either now or previously? So I, I've, I've met with John um, and, and heard his views direct not, you know, not long after I'd been in, in post. And clearly owners um, are a huge investor group mm. into this sport. And the fact that they have continued to invest through you know, the, uh, the global pandemic, I think everybody is incredibly grateful for. Making sure that they are at the heart of our decision moving, moving forward it is of course paramount. I think one of the, um, you know, it is quite easy from the sidelines to offer um, criticism, um, uh, but I, they have offered proposed solutions as well, I do know that. It is actually difficult to make things happen. And I think one of the things in, in my view is the BHA works with its stakeholders mm. and it's really important that those representative groups are actually speaking on behalf of those stakeholders. And that is really hard. Uh, uh, that's not unique to um, horse racing. It, it, you know, I've worked in other sports and it is, it is a common problem. But for, um, you know, speaking on behalf of 50 odd race courses is, is a little bit, um, simpler, you know, some of which are groups, um, than speaking on behalf of a, a huge number. 8,000 uh, owners, yeah. Uh, 8,000 owners, or even, um, you know, the number of trainers we have, the number of jockeys we have. Um, and, and so we will o our decision making will only get better when those representative bodies can truly speak on behalf of, of the people they're representing. And I know that that's difficult. I want to try to come back to that governance issue in a minute, because I'm fascinated to know how how you're going to take the sport forward as a leader. But while we're on the subject of fixtures and funding, is there a plan for growth? Is there a plan to grow horse racing's economy? And if so, how? Uh, and that is not something that the BHA can do alone. Our brief is, is not a commercial growth brief. Mm. Um, but what we absolutely do is work with what is called, you know, for your, for your viewers information, I don't want to bore them to death with racing governance, but the tripartite agreement that, <coughs> excuse me, so um, the BHA working with the horsemen and with race courses to recover from, from COVID and then to grow and prosper into the future. Of course, we're working on that together. Um, and there is no magic wand, they're, mm. they're, they're working on our core racing proposition uh, with the customer at heart who is going to be driving those revenues is a is a key project for us but where where is that where is that key area for growth do you think julie does racing have a key area for growth have you identified it uh, you know there is no magic wand uh, you know I, i've said that at the begin at the beginning of our, our of our chat that I, I think we do continue to talk to government as well, because in terms of a level playing field and how we are funded versus other major racing jurisdictions who we do compete against, um, that there are discussions ongoing with government for their support. Um, but you know, one of their questions will be, and how is racing helping itself? Yeah. And that has got to be through our core racing proposition. It's 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 when we race and the race program that we're putting on to make sure that it can grow, that it continues to attract customers, um, whether they be race day customers, whether they be betting customers. You know, my, my background before sport, um, you mentioned was in brewing, but I was a marketeer. Mm. So it, it was around um, customer growth and trying to ensure that what you are offering is what people want to buy. Um, and that is the only route to growth. And, and in terms of the, your relationship with government, this is where the BHA does lead and, and has made to lead in, in the past. 
the government at the at the end of last year and then reiterated their position at the beginning of this year they they saw no no mileage in imminent levy reform even though we've been told by your predecessor Nick Rust for a, for a year that levy reform was going to be on the table in 2021 that's been kicked into the long grass um, how much more challenging has that made uh, the sports financial future there are, there are two big aspects to our, our current relationship and discussions with government uh, well three actually one is obviously around uh, recovery from the pandemic they've been really supportive in terms of the winter sports survival package um, and ensuring that we can keep racing and get crowds back which has been uh, our, you know in terms of our bandwidth and what we've had to work on this year working with government to get crowds back into race course and i think we've been really successful in that absolutely the, the second area is around sort of fighting a bit of a rearguard action if you like in a, a big proportion of our revenues comes from people who bet on horse racing and there have been some threats to those revenues in terms of the reviews of of the gambling act but also ahead of that review to the Gambling Act, was there going to be a separate look at affordability? And I think we've come together to make sure that government, um, w any decisions that they made, they th that racing wasn't collateral damage and that there were no unintended consequences. So for that's us. been a priority. That has that been you've a priority. absolutely prioritised that, so shoring up racing's relationship with the, with the betting industry. At the same time as doing that, do you see yourself as having a responsibility to hold the betting operators to account to make sure they're offering your customers the sort of product that you want them to, to offer and a responsible product that looks acceptable to the wider public? I think all of those discussions have been really positive, Nick. It's not Nobody's needed mm. their feet holding to the fire because I think nobody wants people who are at risk of harm from problem gambling to, to, to be damaged. So I think... Um, people all want the same thing and, and I think um, so those discussions have been really positive uh, I think but also Julie so it's about an appealing product as well for the, for the, for the non-problem gambler if you like so most of the people watching this program today who want to have a bet every day who want to invest in the sport of horse racing can the BHA um, work with the betting industry effectively to make sure that is a desirable product. It's better to bet on horse racing than it is on, on all these other sports. And they will give you a, a value for, for money product on a consistent basis. Absolutely. And, and again, that's not just the role of the BHA. And you, you can bring influence to bear, do you feel? It, not quickly. That I think there, is, there has been a really good dialogue with people from across um, the betting and gaming industry to, to talk with racing about presenting the product that the punter wants. What can we do to the fixture list, to the race program? Not at the cost of the sport. So again, it's that question of balance and, and it isn't about racing just doing um, the, the betting industry's bidding. It's about working in partnership sure. to deliver what the customer needs. But, but just coming back to that third area of discussion with government, government did say earlier this year that they would look at the timetable for, for reform of the levy, if we could present them with the proper evidence. And so behind the scenes, that's exactly what we've been doing. Uh, and so, yes, we had those couple of burning platforms in terms of the return uh, of crowds and, and recovering from COVID. And, and I know that David Armstrong and the team at the RCA mm. done a, a fantastic job there. The work on the um, response, the industry-wide response to the Gambling Commission, but also behind the scenes, rather than just saying please look at the levy actually pulling together the evidence and the why we need that to happen yes yeah, so because you need to present stronger evidence than before from the from the last letter that the um that the minister wrote in my previous letter we did not feel there was such a case um on the basis of the evidence you put forward last year in, in 2020 before you before you took over julie so are you getting your team or a new team a julie harrington <laughs> style team not a nick russ style team to present a better case to government that there should be levy reform yeah, th this is not about criticizing any of the work that's been done in the not past. at all it's yeah. not it's not it's not a criticism of your predecessor in any respect it's merely different because if the case presented then was not acceptable to government then it's going to be it's got to be angled in a slightly different way hasn't it yeah and and clearly we don't want to communicate with government through through media we're having mm. private conversations with them in terms of um, what is the evidence that that they need to see what are the areas that they need convincing on
But that is still, what you're saying is that is still on the table. The it's, idea of levy reform is still on the table and it is still there. And it's a massive piece of work for yeah. us, Nick. And, and, and I think people, you know, your, your viewers want to trust that we are fighting that fight to, to make sure that British racing can compete with some of our closest um, racing constituencies um, on a level playing field. And of course we're doing that, but we are doing it quietly behind the scenes. I want to talk a little bit about governance. You touched on it. And I know, I know <laughs> it can be seriously dry matter, this. This can be dry as a bone in, if, you, if you're talking about... Get into the yeah, get into the pastries, the, the, tri, the <laughs> tripartite arrangement and so on. But it often strikes me that the chief executive of the BHA has to has to have a, a distinct personality to lead to draw all these conflicting forces together. And as you've said in the past, in previous interviews, to try and point everyone in the same direction. What do you have to bring to the table to, to make that happen? What, are you, what is your skill set, do you think? Well, I would say I've got experience from, from this in other sports. Mm. And, and I think, firstly, an understanding that we are not unique in this. Um, and you know, I, I enjoy working with passionate people. Um, and sometimes the, 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 the different parts of racing, um, it will appear as if we're competing with one another. Mm. When in fact, we're actually, you know, I always, my saying is we're com conflict competing with Netflix and a pizza. You know, we actually um, are not competing with one another. And whatever governance structures you put in place for a sport, unless you have got the right people coming together to have difficult conversations mm. and to be comfortable with having difficult conversations, because those conversations are driven by passion. They're, they're driven by passion for our sport. And if we can direct that passion um, and, and understand that we might have to have some flexibility for the long term, sustainability of the sport I, and I think where I have had some success in the past yeah. is getting people to look at that North Star the sort of long term beyond the immediate 18 months two year horizon. Can you see that star in your own mind? I, 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 think I know vision is is a is a it's a big word I, I think if I were to ask what the Julie Harrington vision was <laughs> is it uh, the, can the, you see that star? I think that in 10 years time, racing continues to be a key part uh, of our sporting life, that we have got some, some pretty big risks and some pretty big headwinds that face racing. And for us to pull together to ensure that we continue to flourish and that this sport is here and flourishing in 10, 20 years time, we are, you know, anybody who works in racing, it's not about the egos, that we are just custodians. Mm. We're custodians on making sure that our heritage assets continue to be here for generations to come to enjoy. So uh, uh, but also to make sure that the young generation who consume those assets in mm. a different way can buy into them and become interested in them. And, and that might mean over um, you know the, the years ahead that we we need to work on how we present what we all love um, slightly differently for for the new um, racing fans coming through the owners uh, and the punters of the future so you mentioned challenges and risk where do you think horse racing is most at risk it's, it's undoubtedly um, for all of us in the sport um, to make sure that we are uh, maintain the trust with the general public in terms of how we look after our horses um, because as soon as that trust begins to be broken you see how quickly movements can form uh, with the speed of social media and before you know it things can, can, can escalate incredibly quickly and so uh, I think initiatives like National Racehorse Week that starts today is about continuing to show the general public how we look after our, our horses, the horses in our care. Um, but then we also have bodies, you know, that the whole sport coming together to create the Horse Welfare Board is to make sure um, that we are showing the right curiosity and that there is the right concern there for 
um, the, the entire life of horses that are bred for racing. And, and the whole sport, it, you know, is all of our responsibility to make sure that number one, that horses are looked after as they should, but number two, that that message is getting out there to the general public. And uh, uh, over 140 trainers have put their money where their mouth is and they are opening their yards this week to invite the general public in. And I just think that is fantastic. Um, the Gordon Elliott uh, return this week, uh, when you were interviewed earlier in the year after the Cheltenham Festival, during the Cheltenham Festival, you said to see our sport on the front pages for the wrong reasons and for the public to have been given the perception that our horses are not cared for is a crisis for the industry. You described us on the brink of an existential crisis. In light of that, how do you reconcile yourself with the fact that he returns this week with um, almost an entire pardon? I mean, you, you can, I, I mentioned earlier about how quickly um, in this social media age, you, things can gather momentum. And that is why um, I, I was talking about in those terms, in terms of this is a, this is a crisis for the sport. You know, I talked to- Is that crisis gone then? Um, I think it is important that we are constantly aware of how important this is to the racing public, to us. You know, I think the biggest outcry in this country was from people who look after horses day in, day out. That, you know, that photograph of, of Morgan the horse is, is it, it really touched people emotionally. And as did uh, the Panorama documentary. Uh, and so I, I think initiatives like um, National Race Horse Week, but really importantly, making sure that the work we are doing behind the scenes on traceability, um, on, on making sure that you know the entire life of the thoroughbred from 30-day um, foal notification all the way through, um, that we, the P it may be that the BHA only have powers within that, uh, that the life of when a horse is in training, mm -hmm. but the period prior to racing and after are equally important in terms of that trust with the general public and the, the the great thing about um, a life well lived, which you know, for, for any of your viewers, it is really worth downloading and having a read of that, which is the the strategy of, of the um, Horse Welfare Board. Mm -hmm. um, it, it really makes the point that that lifetime traceability is incredibly important. Two thousand, over two thousand submissions have been received this week, as the British Horse Racing Authority invited um, all of you to have your say on the continued use. Of the of the Prokush whip in in horse racing, I'm part of your BHA steering group. It's been a very interesting experience so far, though about to get a lot more interesting as as we review those those submissions. It's quite a big number, isn't it? That's a lot of people who who care about using I, the whip. I, I approached this with a completely open mind, Nick, and I I had no idea what to expect in, ter in terms of numbers. Sometimes some of the oxygen that that discussion around the whip receives made me think that perhaps we're going to get tens of thousands mm. of, of submissions so so I for, you know you know as well as I do for someone to actually get sit down and bother to fill yeah. out a form I mean you you're lucky to get anyone to actually yeah. sit and bother to, to do something unless they really care about it so and of those 2,000 I would say 50% of those were from within racing mm -hmm. and 50% outside racing. Yeah. So uh, I think for you on the steering group, it's gonna be incredibly interesting looking at those submissions and seeing what recommendations, in, in, particularly in terms of use of the whip for encouragement. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I personally, I have an open mind in, in terms of what those recommendations will be. If, if, if one of your friends says to you, Julie, you love horse racing, and we started this interview, you're a fan. First, you're a fan then you're an administrator, now you're the boss. <laughs> um, somebody says to you, Julie, but you, you run horse racing. I, I, I'm not a big fan of the, uh, of the whip. What's your view on it? How'd it? Well, how would I respond? Yeah. So I, I guess it would depend on the experience of the friend. You know, my best mate happens to, happens to ride horses mm. um, and is less of a, is more likely to be riding one than watching one. So, you know, it, they would know in terms of use of, use of the whip for um, safety, they would understand that. In terms of, you know, a mate who who was not a horse person and had never been on the back of, their, uh, of a horse in their life, I would say 
it isn't it isn't a question I get asked very often if, I, if I'm honest. Well does uh, that tell its own story then? Um, perhaps you know I, I would say a lot of my friends are sports fans and so they will they will watch a race and want um, their horse to win um, and you know perhaps it's more about the circles that I, I move within that I think I think you know people talk about the name uh, of the whip gives it um, gives people the wrong impression um, people will talk about is it the number of strikes mm. um, the whole point of doing this consultation is it sort of really doesn't matter what I think it's really about understanding the views that come in from those people who ride horses for a living those people who train horses and the people who are watching and betting on horse racing and and you know for you uh, as part of the steering mm. group to look at that in the round, um, you know, w there is also... I think it does matter what you think, though. I th but I don't just think it matters what you think about this. I think it matters what you think about everything to do with the sport. Yeah. Because people are looking to you as a figurehead. The sport doesn't have a clear, defined figurehead. And they want you to be that figurehead. So are, are, are you comfortable taking that mantle, do you think? So what I would, what I would say is, what does Julie think? Julie thinks what the customer thinks is important mm. and, and I want to make sure for the long-term health of the sport that we are doing the right thing. The customer wants to know what does Julie think because the customer wants to know Julie's on on my side and, and from all the experiences you've had Julie how can you convince them you are on their side that you're the right person to take take the sport forward and, and, and to, to provide that new generation that you talked about with, with what they want from the sport. I guess what I've been doing since, since I joined Nick is, it, you know, clearly I've joined in the middle of a pandemic, which was not helpful, but I am getting out there and I'm speaking to not just trainers, not just owners, but punters at the race courses. Um, had regular sessions with, well, I've had a couple of sessions with the Horse Race Betters Forum to talk to them and, and you know, talk about what they would like to see um, to continue to improve. Um, I'm gonna go back to the talking up point. Um, what is already um, a, a fantastic sport? So you know, that, we, mar that marketing ba ba background as a marketeer you think is gonna come to the surface, that's gonna shine? Absolutely, and also the fact that I love pulling passionate people together for us to to work towards the greater good. I, I've sort of got, I'm, I've got the, in my mind's eye this image of you in the room with this, these, these kind of disparate factions and being able to, is that, is that where you think your strength is? I would much rather be in a room than on Zoom with them all yeah. at the moment. Um, absolutely. Um, and because I, I genuinely in my heart of heart think everybody that I've met across racing whether they're a trainer or a race course executive or they're an owner, we all want the long-term um, health of the sport. And, and, and before we end, um, you talk about making the sport, you know, burnishing those assets, but making it perhaps look a little different for a, for a newer audience. We've talked about the way people have attempted to innovate, some, sometimes successfully, sometimes less successfully. Um, how well do you think racing's done with its diversity brief over the last four or five years since it actually became, you know, front and centre in, in, in the BHA's literature? So I think all sports and all society, um, you know, th this is a, an issue that is never away from the front pages and the, and the back pages. And I think everybody is striving to ensure that we are as inclusive as possible and that if anybody wants to come racing, that they are welcomed um, and encouraged and feel welcomed and encouraged. So I, I think there's a, a huge amount that, of work that has been done, um, but I also, I'm not naive, there is a huge amount of work still to do. It struck me when I was, I was thinking about this over the last couple of days, do we, do we actually know for sure, it might sound a bit of a stupid question, but do we know for sure what our composition is? So i.e how diverse we actually are as things stand. Do this, we know, do we have any data? This is not just to, the to who, who goes racing and... It's not just diversity, Nick. You know, you were talking about presenting the sport for, for a newer audience. 
we have got to be driven by, you know, more insight. So yeah. not just data, but actually analyzing that data to, to find real insight in terms of what is this telling us. And that's that's a trying to make sure. So we need sport, to know more, don't we? We, we need, need to, to know more about what we are now in order to figure out where we want to go to, don't a, we? And that is one of the, the, the big, you know, I talked about as having a, a, a a project across those different parties of racing, the horsemen, mm. the race courses, the BHA, looking at the fixture list, the, our proposition from 2023 and beyond. And that has got to also be looking at what is the data, what is the insight telling us. And that goes also to our participants. We don't know enough. You know, there is a little bit of a, a finger in the air, but to really understand not just the fans who are coming racing in race courses but the people who yeah. uh, who watch you know there's a lot of anecdotal um evidence uh, around this but there there isn't you know there, there is there are gaps in our data we need some money for this don't we and and i think that's the the issue that uh, um for other better funded sports um they could you know throw a few million quid at this and and um and for us, I think there will be a more of an iterative approach, which we will need to invest. You know, we've probably underinvested um, in terms of data technology. Um, uh, you know, and we we are slightly behind the curve on that. Are you enjoying this? Uh, I don't mean this interview. <laughs> I mean the job. Are you? <laughs> Um, it was always going to, you know, I came into this, I'm not naive, I came into this role knowing it was going to um, be frustrating and exciting and, you know, in equal equal measure. And it, it's pretty much delivering on what I thought. Are you here for the long term? Are you here to stay? Are you going to... If racing's constituents want me to be, I think that the thing with working in national governing bodies, and this was... Uh, you know, with cycling and with the football association, we are we are the servants of the sport, and you know I am committed to doing the best I can for this sport. Um, but you know, you are here with the permission of the the constituent parties. Julie Harrington, thank you very much. Thanks, Nick. Julie Harrington, chief executive of the British Horse Racing Authority. Subscribe to Racing TV to be notified when more Luck on Sunday videos are appearing online. And don't forget to join me for the show every Sunday morning from 9 o'clock with the best guests.